Western Europe had never known things better. The worst of Viking and Saracen raids were over. The population, trade, food production, all were growing in a unified society. At the core of this society, the acceptance of common religious beliefs. But the harmonious world order, which had evolved in the Dark Ages, was breaking up. There were tensions in the theory of society. Where did its ultimate authority lie? had been claiming to be vicars of St. Peter for centuries. But kings and emperors too claimed a divine right derived from their coronation. Until now, the balance lay heavily with the secular arm. The degradation to which the papacy had sunk during the aptly named Age of the Whores had been changed more by German kings than anything else. The vicars of St. Peter were subordinate to the power of German rulers. But change, reform, was in the air. The main thrust for reform in the church was to try to get rid of sleaze. They called it simony, which means buying bishoprics, purchasing ecclesiastical offices, giving money for ecclesiastical revenues, buying ordination and so on. And they had an enormous sense, of, rather like a modern Italian may do, of, of living in Sleesville. And one of, the, uh, one of the leaders says, simony is universal in France and in Germany and almost the whole of Italy. As often the case, that thrust for reform came from below, from the monks. The Abbey of Cluny in France. Following the French Revolution, left in ruins. But in the 10th century, this was a powerhouse for reform. Its founder had left it free from any lay control. The abbot was dependent on no one but the pope. The abbey sent out a regular force of reforming monks. In an age when married clergy were the norm, here were men devoted to the strict rules of celibacy and chastity. As the church was trying to impose uh, more strict rules of, of marriage, of, of, of one wife for her husband, um, so I think they thought that they would rather see priests who were chaste. Um, they wanted to hear more sermons and sermons on religious life, on the Bible, on the New Testament. And uh, those were all models which were not being carried out by the, the clergy at the time. Not even by the papacy. Its field of vision was immersed in Roman feuds. The devout German Emperor Henry III intervened and duly appointed four German popes, one after the other. Clement. Damasus, Leo, Victor, all names of popes of the early pure church. These were truly the servants of Christ, the heirs of Peter, reforming popes. Not brought up in the suffocating atmosphere of Rome, they had a wider European perspective. Leo IX left Rome immediately after his coronation to carry the message of reform to the churches of France and Italy. But the age-old question of Constantinople cropped up again, and with it the question of papal authority. The two churches had been slowly drifting apart for years. There were differences in language, in theology, Greeks allowed priests to marry. Even the bread of communion was different. At 
clash between East and West was inevitable. Basically, what happened, rather sadly, was that the papacy was trying to improve relationships with Constantinople. And they sent a group of delegates with absolutely disastrous results, partly because they carried in their baggage a very aggressive papal statement about authority. Partly for personal reasons, the Patriarch of Constantinople was a difficult man and the head of the papal legation, a chap called Cardinal Humbert, was a real tough cookie. And the end of the whole thing was that each church excommunicated the other. Many attempts at reconciliation followed, but an open breach was created. It has not been healed to this day. dominated the imagination of the papacy and it had to be asserted to bring about reform in the West as well. It captured the spirit of the Cardinal, Archdeacon and Monk Hildebrand. In 1073 he was elected by popular acclaim Gregory VII. In the Lateran church are preserved the skulls of Paul and Peter and Peter inspired him to transform the church. His exalted vision has come down to us in a list of 27 proposition, the Dictatus Papae. The Pope can be judged by no one. The Roman Church has never erred and will never err till the end of time. The Pope alone can depose and restore bishops. He alone can make new laws, set up new bishoprics and divide old ones. He alone can call general councils and authorize canon law. He can depose emperors. He can absolve subjects from their allegiance. All princes should kiss his feet. Such a vision of papal power was bound to lead to conflict with the emperor, and it came in 1076. Henry IV challenged the pope head on by electing a number of bishops and abbots in Germany and North Italy. When the pope objected, he denounced Gregory as a false monk and pronounced him deposed. Gregory's reply was no less uncompromising. I prohibit Henry from ruling in Germany and Italy. I release all Christians from the oaths which they have sworn to him, and I bind him in the bonds of anathema. The Pope's pronouncement provided Henry's enemies with an excuse to rise against him. To save his throne, he came here to the castle at Canossa in central Italy. Gregory kept him waiting in the snow. Eventually, the Pope emerged and made Henry kiss his stirrup in a gesture of humiliation before he accepted reconciliation. A mighty Pope indeed, then. Or was he? There's a great disagreement about Gregory among historians. Uh, I, I personally regard him as a dangerous driver who eventually drove the car of reform into the ditch. He saw himself as doing nothing new. Nothing. He, he said, but I haven't I have changed nothing. I haven't done anything. All I want to do is to, is to follow the gospel. I think he, didn't, he, he, he genuinely didn't think of himself as, as doing anything different. But he did identify himself very strongly with St. Peter. This identification had challenged the sacred aura of kings. To men like Henry, who believed that they too were vicars of God, Gregory's view seemed like blasphemy. Gregory split the church. He was also to destroy himself. Henry IV is 
an effective and incidentally extremely devout ruler, but an old-fashioned one, and he as emperor led a large army into Italy and had a lot of support from Italy, and also among the reformers, they're getting less and less happy about Gregory's extremism, and eventually uh, the imperial forces simply occupy Rome, and Gregory has to clear out. Left to rot in Salerno, he remained defiant to the end. I have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, I die in exile. But he had etched out a new vision of the claims of his office. Though defeated, his spirit survived him. He dreamt also of leading a liberating army against Islam. Eleven years after his death, Pope Urban II translated that dream into a terrible reality. At a council in Clermont in France, he preached the First Crusade and mobilized the greater part of Western Europe to rescue Jerusalem. He had hoped for a good army. What he got was the biggest army in the history of mankind. After a harrowing march on Friday the 15th of July, they launched a general assault on the city of Jerusalem. It was carnage, and accounts tell of men wading in blood up to their ankles. After the slaughter, weeping for joy, the soldiers of Christ went to adore the sepulchre of Jesus and paid their debt to him. The Pope had become, in every sense, the leader of the Christian world. Gregory VII's vision had been realized. Urban had preached that for those who fought would be granted forgiveness of all their sins. To those who fell in battle, the crown of martyrdom. To the medieval mind, the fear of eternal damnation was very real. Real also the belief that the Pope and the Pope alone could grant access to heaven. In proclaiming the crusade, Urban appealed to a sense of a universal Christian cause. The Pope, not any earthly king or emperor, was the unquestioned head of such a cause. A cause that led men to their maker, their sins forgiven, access to heaven assured. Tragic history has become colourful heritage. The Crusades, despite their unchristian militarism, despite their even racial undertones, offer a chance for pageant and fun. Here in Aigues in the south of France, that past is celebrated. Meticulous care is taken over historical accuracy. Some have argued that the early crusaders were nothing other than mercenary adventurers, land-hungry and penniless younger sons, desperate for a career opening which might bring them fame, fortune, or at least the hope of a little rape and pillage. 
certainly, as crusade followed crusade, a huge range of men and motives were to be involved. Still, most crusaders made huge personal and financial sacrifices. There can be no doubting the spiritual and religious drive, which, to begin with at least, underlay the response to the call to the cross. A call inspired by the papacy. Amongst the many who fought in the Crusades were the Normans. On that famous of famous dates, 1066, they began their conquest of England. But far to the south, churches are witness to their victories in Sicily and southern Italy. Their equestrian skills and their armaments made them the most feared warriors of Western Europe. The earliest invaders into southern Italy were little more than thugs. They conquered and ruled by the sword. There are tales of small bands of them defeating Italian armies of thousands. But in time, they gave birth to a vibrant civilization here. The church was important to them, and they frequently important to the church. Many popes had become dependent on them for support. But deals with the land-hungry Normans meant return payment. One such arrangement was to have a staggering effect, which no one foresaw at the time. Unable to challenge the Normans, the Pope pronounced their leader, William, King of Sicily, with certain rights over the church on the island. That Pope, the only ever English Pope, was Hadrian IV. He extended that right to the northern relations of the Normans in England. The King of England now had the papal right to incorporate Ireland into his realm. The church in Ireland at the time was already experiencing the stirrings of reform. The permissiveness of Irish social and sexual customs, the still tribal church organization there, these were shocking. The Irish were not men but beasts, wallowing in vice. The reforming church would change all this. That, unquestionably, was Hadrian IV's devout hope and belief. He had started, not by design, the first round of the long and tortured relationship between England and Ireland. testimony to the power of the medieval church over men's minds. In medieval times, they sprang up in profusion in Western Europe. Whatever our beliefs, we can but marvel at them. They are testimony of great architectural skills. They are evidence, too, of a rich and powerful Catholic Church. But great buildings were not built by faith alone. Behind them, there was something rarely associated with religion, administration. The papacy was at the centre of it. The city of Bologna in northern Italy. 
by the 12th century, it had earned itself a great reputation for teaching. Not religious teaching, not theology. This was a great centre for the law. Many popes were trained here, and it's an indication of the way of things that there were no saints among the 12th century popes. The church and law became inexorably linked. Papal business multiplied as litigants referred a multitude of matters once settled locally to the papal courts. Books on the law became more numerous than those on theology. There were those who warned, but their warnings fell on deaf ears. The priests had to be taught. What dispensations were needed for cousins to marry? What were the rights to found a new monastery or a private altar? Business grew, and with it the power of the curia and the power of the cardinals, all well trained in legal matters. The cardinals, who are the senior members of the curia, have enormous influence over the election of the pope, and by the late 13th century they've established a system where the pope quite simply is elected by the cardinals, and they've also invented this conclave system, though they shut all the cardinals up, and for a long time wouldn't even give them anything to eat or drink until they'd elected the pope. It was in this clerical ambiance that the cardinals in 1198 chose the ideal man, Innocent III. He'd studied in Paris and Bologna, and his enormous intelligence was matched by his industry. In relations with secular powers, he liked to quote Jeremiah, I have set you up over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow. In England, that view led to confrontation. Innocent wanted his friend Stephen Langton appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. King John would have none of it. He would decide who would be Archbishop. But then in 1213, John is getting involved in a series of other crises, partly internally in England and partly with France. And he decides on a total reversion of policy uh, he recognises Innocent, uh, is reconciled with him, and actually accepts him as overlord of England. Now, I'm afraid Innocent didn't see what was happening for all his canonists as a politician. Uh, he was taken in by John. He thought this was absolutely terrific. And when the barons started taking action against John, incidentally led by the new Archbishop, Stephen Langton, he then started excommunicating the uh, opposition and ended, in fact, by suspending Stephen Langton. King John's seal and one of England's most important documents, the Magna Carta. King John was forced to accept the demands of the barons. Not so innocent. He excommunicated the English and declared Magna Carta null and void. This complicated episode showed that Innocent was immersed in power politics. With this grew more and more bureaucracy. No part of the church escaped the net. Even outlandish monasteries like Strata, Florida in West Wales were woven into the web of papal law and administration. Gone was the independence of the Celtic Church. But underlying everything was a genuine urge for pastoral reform. This was the aim of the Fourth Lateran Council, Innocent's greatest achievement. It tackled an enormous range of issues, including the establishment of Orthodox teaching. This was the council that defined the doctrine of transubstantiation. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. It's a definition still held by the church today. A centralized control reached all the most intimate aspects of Christian life. Every Catholic was now obliged 
to go to confession and communion to the parish priest at least once a year. Under Innocent, the forces of pastoral reform and obedient conformity joined hands. The chain of command reached all things, from pope to peasant. But Innocent had to face those who did not conform. The Jews did not even share the same faith. Under Innocent, they were required to wear distinctive clothing. Certain trades and marriage to Christians were forbidden them. They had to live in special areas, the ghetto. But Innocent was no medieval Hitler. In his time, the Christian faith was the cement of society. Those who did not share the official faith seemed a danger to the foundations of that society. Conformity, orthodoxy. But always in society, there are individuals, the non-conformist, the unorthodox. One such non-conformist was born here, to a worldly merchant class who formed the money delete of so many Italian cities. A young man, he delighted in expensive living, flashy clothes, and nurtured dreams of military fame. The town is Assisi. The young man, Francis. A growing awareness of the plight of the poor, in whom he saw the face of Christ, led Francis to repudiate his father's wealth. He identified himself with the destitute underclass. Disciples gathered round him following a simple set of rules derived from the Gospels. Groups of this sort had been common enough in Italy. The church had always suppressed them. Francis was different. A deeply devout Catholic, he revered the sacraments and the church's teachings and had a deep respect even for wicked priests. In 1210, he set himself to win papal approval for his movement. The problem is that we don't have any written evidence from Innocent III or Francis about what went on between them. What seems to have happened is that in the, probably in the autumn of 1210, Francis came from Assisi with his companions to ask Innocent III for approval for his way of life. Francis wanted to lead an evangelical life following Christ and the Apostles and wanted to, to be approved by the Pope but not to follow any approved order. The legend is, of course, that Innocent rejects Francis in the first place and goes away and has a dream, and dreams that he sees a young man holding up the Lateran on his shoulder and supporting the church and saving the church. And I'm sure that that represents what Innocent did believe about what Francis's power was. Innocent has the problem of how he's going to sell this rather unattractive individual, perhaps, to his cardinals and to the curia and to the church at large. How he does this, I think, uh, is, is really rather clever. Um, Francis is presented as the norm of evangelical perfection. Uh, his way of life is the most perfect evangelical life that could be lived by a layman. Francis and his companions are laymen, they're not priests, they're not in orders. Uh, and so what Innocent does is to tonsure, have, have Francis tonsured, um, shave, have his head shaved, and Francis swears an oath of obedience to the Pope, and Francis's companions swear an oath of obedience to Francis. And he is then given the licentia ubique praedicandi, the license to preach anywhere. I've always said, I think, that, that without Innocent III, there would have been no St. Francis. Francis could well have remained in the wilderness. His ragged clothes remain, the proud possession of the church in Assisi. He had formed the fastest growing movement within the church. Almost from the start, the movement polarized. Those who insisted on absolute poverty and those, in the interest of practical realism, who sought to come to terms with property. The realists triumphed. 
Their victory is embodied in the elaborate papal basilica erected with supreme irony over the bones of the little poor man of Assisi. But that's another story. In Innocent's day, the Franciscans shared with their pope the spirit of evangelical reform. There were other such movements not so delicately handled by Innocent. In the south of France, the worldliness of the church produced waves of revulsion amongst devout Christians. Here, that revulsion spun off into heresy with the Cathars. Their leaders, mighty orators, converted villages and towns throughout the Languedoc with a calling for a pure, simple Christian life. These leaders followed strict written rules. They ate no meat, abstained from sex, and denied the church's sacraments. Rome, to them, was the whore of Babylon, the Pope Antichrist. Les Cathars prétendaient être les descendants des apôtres. Ils s'appelaient eux-mêmes pauvres du Christ, chrétiens ou apôtres. L'Église romaine les a nommés, dénoncés comme hérétiques, comme apôtres de Satan. Donc déjà, on voit le, le problème. Ils prétendaient être la vraie Église du Christ. À partir de l'an 1000, ils prétendaient suivre la voie des apôtres alors que la papauté les a dénoncés pour ne rejeter tout ce qui était institution ecclésiastique, tout ce que les conciles, les pères de l'Église, avaient ajouté au message nu du Nouveau Testament. At first, attempts were made to persuade them back to Mother Church by the founder of the first order of preachers, Dominic. He failed. Then, when one of Innocent's legates was killed by Cathar extremists, the Pope turned to force. A new crusade was preached, this time in Christian Europe. At Béziers, a massive army congregated to root out the heretics. Women, children and the elderly fled to the church for sanctuary, Cathars and Catholics alike. The crusaders smashed their way in, and the cry went out, kill them all, God will know his own. The blood-hungry crusaders marched on to Carcassonne. Its fortifications were no defense against such a force. The inhabitants were routed, fleeing almost naked, taking with them, in the words of one crusader, nothing but their sins. At nearby Bram, the crusaders, led now by Simon de Montfort, spared the citizens their lives. They were tied together in lines, their noses hacked off, their eyes gouged out. A one-eyed man led the pathetic procession to the next village to warn. The massacre of the Cathars caused the death of ten times more Christians than the total martyred in the Colosseum. Conformity, orthodoxy ruled. For a century and a half, all the notable popes had been lawyers. In 1294, another Bologna-trained cleric, Boniface VIII, was elected. A mysterious man, proud, fierce. He was to take a step too far. In 1300, he declared the first jubilee, or holy year. Thousands of pilgrims flocked to Rome, adding enormously to the prestige of the papacy. Boniface also displayed some of the worst sides of clerical careerism. Enriching his relatives at the expense of the church and waging war against his family's traditional rivals, the Colonna. His many enemies spread disturbing rumours. Sex with boys or women, he was alleged to have said, was no worse a sin than rubbing one hand against another. Even more disturbingly, he was said to have been a non-believer, rejecting the resurrection. But he did believe in the papacy, passionately. He claimed that it was altogether necessary for salvation, 
for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Here in Anagni, to the south of Rome, that claim led to trouble. Boniface led a war of propaganda against his detractors, especially the French. He even prepared a bull excommunicating the King of France, but before it could be promulgated, the French struck. Troops smashed into this papal palace and mobbed him. In full papal regalia, Boniface shouted, here is my neck, here is my head. The troops drew back. Even they could not kill a pope. The following day, the citizens of Anagni forced the French to flee. Boniface never recovered from his ordeal. Returning to Rome, a broken man, a month later he died. The outrage of Anagni shocked Italy and Europe. But in a real sense, it called the bluff of the high doctrine of the medieval papacy. For most of the 14th century, the bishops of Rome lived far away from Rome, in the fortified city of Avignon. The magnificent buildings here are the remains of what has come to be seen as one of the low points of the papacy, its Babylonian captivity. It started by accident, the election of the Bologna-trained lawyer cleric Clement V. Anxious to please the King of France, he was crowned in Lyon. The move to Avignon was only intended as a short-term stay. At the time, it seemed a good move. Far more central than Rome, it was more accessible to the many who now had business in the papal court. The papacy also was well out of squabbling Roman politics. In Avignon, they were elected formally by the College of Cardinals. The Third Lateran Council of 1179 had finally if you like, canonically laid down what the process of papal election was to be. It was to be uh, by uh, the College of Cardinals exclusively. Hitherto, the Roman population had taken part, uh, the aristocratic factions within Rome, and above all, the emperor had been parties, as it were, to the papal election. Now it formally resided with the College of Cardinals. The truth was, of course, that that uh, meant that pressure was put on to have a College of Cardinals created, which was amenable uh, to suggestions as to who should be uh, the next pope. And the next pope was French. So were most of the cardinals. They were indeed more amenable to the throne of France than that of Peter. All the popes that followed were French. In Avignon, the papacy had become the servant of the King of France. They were not all bad popes. John XXII, a person of simple habits and sober living, introduced a rigorous regime into Avignon. Yet he was confronted by a growing rift between gospel values and the machinery of the medieval church. The church was wealthy, powerful, woven into the politics of Europe. The left wing of the Franciscan movement denounced all this wealth and power. Christ, they claimed, had owned nothing, and so the church must renounce all wealth, all power. For all his austerity, John knew that these views would dissolve society itself. He condemned the dogma of apostolic poverty. The Franciscans who disagreed were handed over to the Inquisition and burnt at the stake. It seemed as though the papacy was against the Gospels. His successor was in many ways the opposite. Benedict XII was a man of the people, a Cistercian monk.
Yet it was he who built the great fortress of Avignon, the palace of the popes. This was a structure built to stand. The papacy was here to stay. There was no yearning for a return to Rome. His successor, Clement VI, was the opposite again, a grand seigneur. Totally aligned to the King of France, he was a real big spender. His own private morals were notorious. Money was spent freely and a good time had by all. The papal court became a byword for luxury. Avignon flourished. Tout d'abord parce que euh, donc la ville va accueillir une population nouvelle, euh, souvent cosmopolite, population qui sera constituée aussi bien de euh, maçons, d'artisans, d'artistes que de cardinaux. Ces cardinaux nombreux viennent à Avignon accompagnés d'un grand nombre de familiers, de leur entourage, et ils vont se faire construire dans Avignon, mais aussi dans les environs, et notamment à, à Villeneuve-les-Avignons, de l'autre côté du Rhône, ils vont faire construire un certain nombre de petits palais, résidences qui sont appelées les livrées cardinalices, souvent pourvues de tours, et ces résidences vont transformer considérablement le paysage urbain. All the time, papal administration grew and grew to a count of some 4,000 people. And when the living was easy, reform was not. Precisely at this time, Europe was hit by the plague, the Black Death. on a sinful world, a sinful church, and a particularly sinful papacy. A new wave of genuine religion sprang to life, full of devotion to the Virgin Mary. Brigitte of Sweden, daughter of a king, Catherine of Siena, daughter of an artisan, pleaded for a return to the early pure church. In Avignon, the papacy was trapped by the system and by the cardinals. The Pope is virtually always uh, an ex-cardinal by this time, by the 14th century, and in fact it's, that's hardly changed ever since. They almost always elect from their own numbers. Uh, they're enormously powerful, they have huge wealth, a uh, whole series of bishoprics and appointments within the various national churches, and they're mostly exceedingly capable and, and skilled men, many of them lawyers by training. We, we tend to think that the medieval church must, uh, uh, must have been governed by people who are trained in theology. On the whole, it wasn't, it was just governed by lawyers. This was not religion, said the detractors. It was a bureaucratic system. Was it the King of France or the relics of the Apostles that gave power to the papacy? It had to return from Avignon to its rightful place, to Rome. Another French Pope was elected, Gregory XI. French, yes, but devout too. He shared the same yearnings as the reformers and believed Rome to be the only true home for him. In 1377, the Babylonian captivity ended. The papacy was back in Rome. Then, within months, Gregory was dead. The conclave, mobbed by the Roman crowds, chose an Italian to pacify them, Urban VI, a disastrous choice. He turned out very quickly to be a highly authoritarian, uh, individual uh, 
who um, set about what he would call the reform, what they would call the destruction of the church. And within three months, uh, the majority of the cardinals had retired from Rome, uh, and there they claimed that they had only um, elected Urban under duress, that it was no election, it was an improper election, declared it in effect null and void, and proceeded to appoint, uh, to elect a new pope, uh, Clement VII. So you had a situation thereafter in which you had two popes, uh, because neither would yield, neither would give way to the other. There had often been anti-popes before, but now two popes had been elected by the very same cardinals. The great Western schism had begun. Nations, peoples, even saints were confused. As year followed year, men began to ask how could it be ended? They decided to take more radical measures, and, and this, there's enormous pressure from public opinion for this by this time, and you get the Council of Pisa in 1409, where both popes are deposed by the senior churchmen, and a new one, Alexander V, elected. It was a splendid policy. The only trouble was that they didn't manage to get rid of the two existing popes, who do retain a fair amount of support, and the uh, total consequence of the Council was that the church had three popes instead of two. On a grey day in the winter of 1441, the city of Constance in southern Germany became the next setting for yet another council. Now a restaurant, the site of the council still exists. It was a massive gathering with over 300 bishops, still more theologians, and all with their supporters. For many, a council offered the only means of salvation for a divided church. In the 20th century, this monument was erected to celebrate the 500th anniversary of that council. It shocked everyone on its unveiling. A whore upholds the papacy on the one hand, the devil on the other. The council, which sat for four years, transformed the city of Constance. Its population rose from six to 60,000. It included some 1,200 whores who attended to the needs of three papal courts. John Huss, a revolutionary reformer under promise of safe conduct, was enticed to attend. The records of his trial have survived. He had dared challenge the dogma of the church and the authority of the papacy. He was branded a heretic and burnt at the stake. In Innocent's day, the church had coped with Francis. Now it could not cope with a reformer like Huss. The papacy had no integrity in anything, said its detractors. This was a corrupt church led by a corrupt papacy. Many sought genuine reform and wanted the council to override the power of the papacy. All wanted the schism ended. The arguments raged, but in the end, an agreement of sorts was reached. The three popes were all deposed and the Roman, Martin V, elected the one true pope. With his coronation, the schism was ended. The divisions of the church were, it seemed, healed at last. Nothing could have been further from the truth.